Good morning. 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 How is everybody? Good, thanks. Good. Well, I think it is uh, just 8 a.m., so we will get started with today's Grand Rounds. And introducing our special Grand Round speaker today is Dr. Vince Krines, our Division Chief of Endocrinology. So, Vince? Great. Good morning. Point. Good morning. It's my pleasure and, and privilege to be able to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Samantha Pabick. She um, is... Uh, currently an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. Uh, she received her uh, MD degree from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, where she was elected to the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Then she moved to Madison and did her residency and fellowship in endocrinology here. During her fellowship, she actually got an NPH award as well. And I think it was during that time that she really developed a passion for the topic of today's talk, uh, medical management of obesity. She has more than 10 publications. She is a co-investigator on several clinical trials focusing on weight management and or metabolic health. Uh, she um, is very active in our educational mission, um, teaching learners at all different phases. Uh, she's lectured on obesity and diabetes um, in several venues at the med school. She's uh, actively engaged in CME throughout the state and nationally. Um, so she's really emerged as a as a leader in this, you know, rapidly uh, growing field that I know is of great interest to to this audience. Oh, and I should oh, sorry, I forgot awards. Sam uh, received a very prestigious Pearl Settler Research Award as well. So I'm really excited about her talk today and it's an awesome title. So welcome, Dr. Pavic. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Sajak. I mean, Dr. Krines. Hold on, that would make sense if my slides advance. There we go. <laughs> I'm here today uh, delighted on this almost Halloween day to hopefully solve this puzzle with an O, trick or treat obesity. My disclosures include data safety monitoring for Eli Lilly, and that I will plan to reference off-label therapies in today's discussion. I have two additional disclosures that were not mentioned before. We all come to this lecture having had different experiences with weight, food, and, and body perception. And some of the data presented may affect your personal feelings about food or obesity and may trigger undesirable thoughts. So keep this in mind and stop listening if needed. My other statement is that I'm in this field because I saw patients in desperation looking for solutions to help numerous medical problems. I'm not trying to uh, perpetuate weight stereotypes or peddle quacky unsubstantiated or illegal cures. So for our learning objectives today, I'm hoping to get everyone on the same page that obesity is a disease and to give you talking points in, in discussing obesity with your patients, payers, policymakers, the public, I hope everyone here will think about the impact of their particular area of medicine and recognize weight-related effects of common pharmaceuticals and use this knowledge to monitor and mitigate the dreaded weight gain side effect. I wanna help you create a framework for prescribing obesity medicines. And to make this easy for you, I want you to be able to find lots of resources. So together with CCKM and a bunch of great minds, we've created two guidelines for management of obesity. One just became available this month um, and I'll reference that a lot today because I want you to be able to find it and use it. So get ready for an hour of a lot of things you didn't know you needed to know. You're going to get out your flux capacitors to start, and we're going to go back in time to my intern year, 2014. I remember two particular cases from July of 2014 in my primary care clinic. There was the lemur bite with the rash that I quickly sent to ID. Thank you. And then there was the patient seemingly like lots of other patients, someone with hypertension and diabetes and presumably mazzled and dyslipidemia and possibly sleep apnea and osteoarthritis and high risk for cancers and mood disorders and lung disease and kidney failure and infection because they had obesity. I told the patient they could improve their overall health with weight loss and entered a referral for the medical weight loss um, to the medical surgical weight loss clinic where their team could wave their magic wands and remove visceral adipose. Little did I know at the time but there was not actually a medical weight loss clinic then. Uh, and my referral was instantly bounced back. But now in fact, there is a single physician in that clinic doing medical weight loss and myself and a few others across the system um, are, are seeing patients in a referral capacity. 
but we've so far not created the dreamy magic wand multidisciplinary clinic I had once believed in. And we're all booked out six months to a year. And so given that expanding the service has not been one of the top priorities of the institution, what with the pandemic and everything, I've really evolved my goals. So because obesity is so prevalent, instead of treating it in a specialist referral capacity, I wanna expand your knowledge of effective therapies so that all of you feel comfortable treating obesity. Chances are you never heard of an AOM or anti-obesity medicine in medical school or residency, and you may have some hesitance in prescribing them. But I'm here to tell you that this is the way the world is going, and I'm happy to help you learn and feel comfortable. In a few months, you won't just feel comfortable, you'll feel great as you see patients having meaningful improvement in their lives. I'm going to start at the beginning. So is obesity actually a disease? Isn't it just a lifestyle choice? To start to grapple with this question, we have to consider the definition of a disease, a disorder of structure or function in a human animal or plant, especially one that has a known cause and distinctive group of symptoms, signs, and anatomical changes. And you can say that obesity as an entity is heterogeneous and has many possible causes, some of them associated with a patient's own choices. But I can say that numerous data have shown that inappropriate hunger-related hormonal signaling is present in all types of obesity. So it took some time, but as obesity increased, various organizations have adopted the position of obesity as a disease, but naysayers still abound. What, what I can say now, after the past four years of practicing with highly effective anti-obesity medicines, is that you may not have believed in a disease until you have known its cure. I felt like that needed to be said in a particularly poignant way. So I looked for some William Osler quotes and he doesn't have anything like that. So I'm saying it now. My patients talk about appetite suppressing medications as miracle drugs. And whereas previously they were constantly having battles with themselves, I really shouldn't eat that donut in the break room. I really shouldn't turn into that Taco Bell. Now they don't even notice the donut or the fast food. Their inappropriate hypothalamic upregulation propagating a search for food has been tamed. I went through a day and a half thinking about temptations that are all around us because many human hypothalamuses are telling their bodies to eat any and all available food, even in a state of nutritional excess. You will see that food temptations are pinging us everywhere. Every time we say no, we're fatiguing, and studies have shown that the more times we have to say no, the more likely we are to eventually cave. I wake up with a plan to eat hard-boiled eggs, but my spouse made oatmeal. I know I'll be hungry in two hours if I ate oatmeal, but it smells so good. There's a cookie left over from that box lunch yesterday, just sitting on the counter calling my name. I dropped my daughter off at school and I'm perplexed at the massive volume of soda being delivered to an elementary and similarly dismayed by the advertising this truck is getting around the kids, but Coke sounds good. I get to clinic and I'm greeted by the sustenance box. Now it's time for coffee, surgeon's buying. It's Sherry's last day, so we ordered pizza for lunch and I managed to get myself out of there and go choose a salad in the cafeteria, but I'm confronted by this. Now I'm home sorting laundry. Why shouldn't my one-year-old personify this high sugar treat? Could anyone else go for a cupcake? We head out for an errand before dinner and wouldn't it just be easy to stop at McDonald's and, instead of cooking when we get home? Got to stop at the store to get some toothpaste but can't get through the checkout without having to say no to all of these goodies. Time for a bedtime story. Elmo is homesick but his grandma will make him feel better with pie. And when visiting your relatives in Chicago, you, you are completely stuffed after lunch, but you cannot say no to the local ice cream. You can see how diseased hypothalamuses causing hunger or even a willingness to eat in a state of nutritional excess are extremely problematic in the world we live in. Calling this a disease is really important because it's some, if something is a disease, insurance companies should undertake coverage of highly effective treatments. As of right now, they routinely don't, but I'll get to that later. Even if obesity is a disease, chances are you as healthcare providers have some bias against patients with obesity. Sometimes this goes so far as to be explicit. Some OBGYNs in South Florida spawned multiple position statements when they were refusing to see patients over 200 pounds. But short of this, most of us, if we take the implicit association test available through Harvard, we'll find out we have some implicit biases against obesity. And it starts early with the association being detectable even in third year medical students. And it's important to be aware of and to take the steps to ensure that your patients are getting excellent care, no matter what their size. It's really hard to talk about obesity because it is so stigmatized. The words I say to patients are that many bodies have evolved to avoid dying of starvation uh, during a famine. I talk about the imbalance of neurochemicals regulating hunger and satiety at the lizard brain. I normalize obesity. 70% of people are carrying more weight than is considered healthy. 
that is clearly not something that we can blame on an individual. I look at predispositions that are out of their control. Well, if you were born premature, your body grew accustomed to saving every calorie and it became very efficient. I also believe in talking to all patients about adiposity, even when theirs is normal. In anticipatory guidance for patients in their 20s and 30s who do not have eating disorders, I say, did you know most adults gain one to two pounds a year, particularly during the holidays, and have added 40 pounds to their baseline adult weight by their 60s? It's very reasonable to have a scale and weigh yourself from time to time. If you've gained five pounds, intervening early helps prevent uh, that from becoming 20. This is a tool I use when patients are seeing me um, not for weight loss, but for another reason. And it can be really motivating to show them how weight loss might affect their specific disease. If the patient has had a vascular event, losing less than 10 pounds has been shown to reduce the risk of a secondary event. If they're hoping to get off CPAP, they're three times more likely to do so if they lose 20 pounds or so. Losing 7.5% will improve histology and mazzled, and presumably risk of progression to cirrhosis. If they've just been diagnosed with prediabetes, every 1% of their body weight that they lose decreases the progression to type 2 diabetes by 10%. If they have diabetes and they can achieve the lofty goal of 35 pounds of weight loss, 86% of people will have remission of that disease. For men hoping to increase their testosterone, a 3% BMI reduction can, reduce, can raise their test testosterone by almost 100 points. And if a patient's trying to get pregnant, I inform them that weight loss as little as 6 to 7% of their body weight can increase ovulation and also make their future pregnancy safer. Another thing I do in an appointment is look for pharmacologic offenders triggering weight gain. This slide is designed for everyone in the audience, even those of you who don't ever see yourself specifically treating obesity. I want you to consider the medications you prescribe and how they could affect weight. I can't tell you how often a patient comes to me with recent weight gain that they can't really explain and come to find out it correlates temporally with the start of a new medication. And this happens for meds that we all know about like steroids and insulin and antipsychotics. We've also been taught, we, we've all been taught and recognized those medicines and their potential for weight gain. But I've been trying to quantify expected weight gain in the same way that we describe weight loss for the anti-obesity medicines because the average doesn't tell the full story. There are a certain percent of people who respond differently to certain medicines. This table is definitely incomplete because studies don't report this data in a homogenous way, but where I have data, I think you'll find it striking. You have memorized that Depo causes weight gain, but do you know how much? This 2009 study noted that average weight gain on Depo is nearly 10 pounds, but only a quarter of people gain weight on it. So this heterogeneous response, that means for 75% of people, Depo is fine. And for some unfortunate souls out there, they might be gaining 30 to 50 pounds on this medication. You've also been taught that beta blockers cause weight gain, and this is true, but it's a pretty low amount compared to other medicines. And a quick takeaway is that if you have a choice, Carvedilol is the most weight neutral beta blocker. And here I have listed some antidepressants. These are very common sleepers, the meds that clinicians prescribed without knowing the potential side effects because the charts on UpToDate are so misleading. The meds patients took having no idea that their weight could be affected. You can see that mirtazapine and paroxetine are the, wor uh, are the worst culprits as expected, but that escitalopram also causes weight gain in nearly half of the patients who start it, and 15 pounds of weight gain is no joke. Citalopram is not as bad, and yet we see that 2% of patients may actually be gaining 20% of their body weight on it, highlighting that some patients have an atypical response to meds, and hopefully they don't go unrecognized. Perhaps the biggest sleeper is venlafaxine. It is extraordinarily common that I identify this as the single medicine um, that is a cause of a patient's recent weight gain. And when I stop it, patients typically lose some, if not all of the weight that they gained on it. Going forward, I hope that you might include this when you talk about risks of starting one of these medicines, advising the patients to keep an eye on weight and call if, you're, if they're experiencing weight gain over a certain threshold. And when a patient tells you they've suddenly gained 20 pounds in six months, that you'll think to look back in the medical record and see if they had started gabapentin or trazodone or some new biologic that I haven't even heard of yet and decide if that was an adverse effect of the medication and may not be worth its continuation. If you absolutely need to start a medicine that induces weight gain, because sometimes we do, consider starting a medicine along with it that can act as an appetite suppressant. So metformin is actually indicated for this reason when you're starting an antipsychotic. And I think we'll see a lot more of this in the next couple of years as the new medicines become more popular. So then I spend some time or a lot of time with my patients talking about their lifestyle, eating, sleeping, moving habits. They often rush to tell me 
all of the things that they that you're supposed to do. So obviously the internet is full of terrifying amounts of misinformation, but you wouldn't believe how many statements are propagated with our, within our own health system that are either completely untrue or not supported by data. It's time to test our knowledge. So the myth that breakfast is the most important meal of the day seems to have it seems to be attributable, attributable to none other than Dr. John Harvey Kellogg of breakfast cereal fame. When we look at characteristics of successful weight losers, it's true they are more likely to eat breakfast than their non-losing counterparts. But if we randomize people to eating breakfast, we don't see a difference in weight loss. So it's time to stop shaming our patients for not eating breakfast. What about the frequent small meals? This is an idea that's touted in almost every nutrition note that I've ever read. And not only are frequent small meals not shown to be superior in facilitating weight loss, but some studies show that, show that this strategy is actually associated with higher weight. So intermittent fasting, this is the concept that taking in very few calories on some days while consuming um, more calories on other days seems to follow the law of if it works for you, it works. It's a good strategy for people who end up losing about as much weight on other isocaloric calorie restriction. Whether you eat 1,200 calories a day, every day, or 500 calories some days and alternate with 1,800 kilocal days, you're getting 8,400 calories in a week and you were previously getting 12,000, you're likely to lose weight, at least initially. This strategy is notably superior for a diabetes control, um, and so that's another thing to think about with it. Time-restricted eating refers to having a longer period of the day of time on a given day when one does not eat. And Reed showed that this that time-restricted eating can be helpful, particularly noting that earlier timing of the last meal and longer duration between last meal and sleep onset predicted lower total calorie intake. We haven't fully qualified, quantified why this is, but circadian rhythm likely plays a role. Shift workers are 23% more likely to have obesity, according to a 2018 meta-analysis by Sun. And that's a fun fact for those of you on call tonight to ponder at 3 a.m. In terms of diet soda, no one wants to hear this, but artificially sweetened beverages may potentially affect adiposity. The jury's still out. Huang 2017's review noted that the results of studies on weight, calorie intake, and ASBs, artificially sweetened beverages, are fairly heterogeneous and likely affected by a selection bias. But interestingly, both people who consume ASBs versus consuming the same amount of sugar sweetened beverages tend to have about double the risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to those who did not consume any sweetened beverages. So something's going on with metabolism or habits and people who drink soda of any type tend to express more preference for sweet foods and candy. Ah, the exercise myth. This is where I think gyms should be prosecuted for January false advertising. Exercise does not typically induce weight loss unless patients are exercising more than six hours a day. However, exercise is very good for you it improves heart health and risk of cancer and mood and notably prevents weight gain. I have so many patients who start on an exercise regimen, fail to lose weight and stop it because they're discouraged. I try to make a very blatant statement that they should engage in physical activity without the expectation of weight loss. This one is true. Uh, if you don't sleep, you don't lose weight. And this is a nod to those of you who are up at 2 a.m. working on grant applications or in baskets. People who get less than seven hours per sleep of sleep per night are more likely to have obesity and less likely to have success in weight loss. And then since the dawn of the obesity nutrition research boom, i.e. like 2004, people have argued low fat or low carb. And most of the time it comes pretty close to a draw, but a 2020 meta-analysis found that low carb diets outperform low fat diets in, in terms of weight loss. And this clinician and many others opinion, the vilification of fat and concomitant supplementation of our entire food system with sugar and carbohydrates has been the single most important driver of the obesity epidemic. So after we've gone through a patient's whole lifestyle, I make whatever suggestions I can addressing things, these things above and any habits they have like eating due to boredom or stress. And then I tell them about how weight loss usually happens. Weight loss generally follows a predictable trajectory, and we have lots of data on what this looks like from the placebo groups of all the pharmaceutical trials, which were conducted with lifestyle change. I always tell patients I hope that they're the outlier and that they have more success than predicted, but then when we look at averages, we see that most people lose weight over about three months and average two to 5% of their body weight loss, though patients in the diabetes prevention program did lose more, like five to 10%. 
Their initial weight loss inertia predicts their end weight loss. And by three to six months, most patients are generally plateauing. We, we know that there comes a concomitant increase in, le- in ghrelin, the hunger hormone, around this time. By six months, weight regain may be starting to set in. These timelines are really important for interpreting evidence from weight loss studies, most of which do not have follow-up beyond six months, so keep that in mind. When we examine longer-term data, particularly involving patients who who were not in pharma studies, we see that 80% of weight lost may be regained by five years. This is where I tell patients that there's no shame in taking a little assistance. If we think of an analogy comparing treating obesity uh, to getting between two buildings in a rainstorm without getting wet, Here's how I think of it. Using a newspaper to cover your head will get you, will work for some people. People who don't have far to go, who have awnings they can duck under if it's raining lightly. But to liken your, or to increase your chances of success, you might take an umbrella, which I liken to these higher intensity options, medications, ketogenic diet, and surgical and endoscopic procedures. So the way I introduce a ketogenic diet or therapeutic carb restriction to patients is by saying, don't believe anything you read on the internet. Ketosis is, it involves the concept of taking in less carbs than, than normal. And so ketosis is generally achieved in patients who are getting less than 50 grams of carbs per day. When patients are not getting enough carbs to maintain their energy needs, the body shifts to lipolysis for energy and free fatty acids are broken down in the liver, create ketones, which then can enter the TCA cycle. What's fascinating here is the presence of ketones in the blood seems to suppress hunger at the hypothalamus. So patients in ketosis don't report that compensatory hunger increase that typically occurs when patients are losing weight with other strategies. A systematic review by Anton in 2017 found that patients were more likely to lose a clinically significant amount of weight in both the short term, less than three months, and the long term, greater than six, on ketogenic diets compared to other strategies like low fat and Mediterranean diets. The key caveat is that the diet is only effective while someone's in ketosis. So it's definitely recommended as a long-term lifestyle change. I tell patients I'm not advocating for bacon, burger, butter type diets, because although those will put you in ketosis, we believe the high saturated fat content um, can be really atherogenic. And so therefore I tell them, I want them on a Mediterranean diet without the carbs, vegetables, chicken, fish, olive oils, nuts, and some other meats and cheese is not intended to be more than what they were already consuming at baseline. They don't need to supplement with any oil sold online, and they generally don't need to test to see if they're in ketosis because they can feel it. They note this absence of hunger. Quartz Insurance recently partnered with a company called Verda Health who claims that they can resolve your patient's diabetes with diet. And it's true, they're using a ketogenic platform. So take note of this if your patients are involved and make sure that they're very clear on the fact that this needs to be a long-term lifestyle. All right, so this diet might be unsafe for some very rare groups of people with carnitine cycle deficiencies, problems with acyl dehydrogenase and porphyria. It's not recommended in pregnancy due to lack of data, not recommended in breastfeeding due to risk of lactational ketoacidosis. And I've rarely, ha- or I've, I've actually commonly had to stop it um, for people on SGLT, ha- had to stop SGLT at two inhibitors because that increases the risk of euglycemic ketoacidosis. I find this diet works beautifully in type 2 diabetes and also quite well in type 1 diabetes. And as we convened experts from across the institution, we discussed that it's even reasonable to consider this dietary strategy in CKD as long as we're not uh, recommending a protein increase and cirrhosis as long as we're paying careful attention to volume management because ketosis causes a natriuresis and may require some diuretic adjustment. So details on this are in our recently approved uh, CCKM guideline. And in terms of the risk of adverse events, it's, it's quite low. There have only ever been five cases of diet-induced ketoacidosis published in the literature, and it seems to be a very rare phenomenon. In a 2017 series, there was no clinically or statistically significant changes in blood pH, anion gap, or plasma bicarb. As with all major weight losses, uh, gallstones may occur. And it's known from studies of children on ketogenic diets for man- management of epilepsy that the risk of kidney stones is higher with about three to 7% of patients being affected. So excellent hydration is encouraged. We also know that bone loss occurs very commonly with most types of weight loss. So we encourage adequate calcium and vitamin D intake, uh, and there's going to need to be more research on this uh, and bone loss in general with weight loss. And then though long-term data is limited, we believe that the improvements in weight, blood pressure, blood sugars on a ketogenic diet all likely improve long-term cardiovascular risks. 
So the next section is medications. And medications are indicated for patients with obesity or overweight, um, BMI greater than 27, with a weight-related comorbidity, who have not achieved their weight goals with lifestyle changes alone. These are not recommended in pregnant or breastfeeding people. So those are the, the op official national guidelines. But the most important inclusion criteria uh, is that the patient have financial access to the medication. So here's how I view the current insurance landscape for coverage of AOMs. The obesity epidemic is an out of control fire being fueled by the food industry and capitalism. And there have been some effective treatments, but the vast majority of insurers are not covering these medications. So things that you should know, many insurance plans offer an anti-obesity medication menu. Generally an insuring entity is prevent, like a workplace is presented with this menu and can choose to opt into coverage or opt out. If they opt out, AOMs are treated as a fixed exclusion they generally have no amount of legwork to do a prior authorization will get covered. I therefore ask patients to do the legwork themselves and find out if they have AOM coverage. Right now, the state health insurance plan, so University of Wisconsin employees and all other state employees do not have access to AOMs. UW Health has opted out. GHC has a fixed exclusion for AOMs. Medicare has a fixed exclusion for AOMs, which would reverse if the treat and, treat and reduce obesity act is ever passed. Badger Care does allow coverage of AOMs with a rather asinine caveat that they will only cover medications for two years of a patient's life, which is in contrast to what we know about the need for long-term use of these medications. Because if you start the medication and lose weight and you, re and you stop the medication, you will certainly, almost certainly regain that, that weight loss. Many other employers in the area have opted out, but I definitely recommend my patients, particularly in small companies, advocate with their human resources departments to add coverage of these medicines. Bellin and Aspirus have added coverage for their employees and they're collecting data on cost effectiveness, including assessments of workplace absenteeism. Prior to 2022, I could get diabetes branded GLP-1s covered for diagnoses like insulin resistance, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome. In 2023, insurers just cracked down and stopped covering these medicines for anything less than a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So I look and I pray for that A1C greater than 6.5. I scour the chart for any two fasting glucoses over 126 or anything over 200. And sometimes if we're close to the diagnosis, I go fishing and I have them do an oral glucose tolerance test because if that comes back above 200, I can code the diagnosis and get the meds covered. Here are the medicines that are currently FDA approved for medical weight loss, along with the mechanism of action and their efficacy. I really don't even give Orlist at the time of day because it's fairly ineffective and miserable to take. All of the more effective weight loss medicines work by affecting hunger and satiety signals at the hypothalamus, inhibiting NPY AGRP nucleus, which stimulates hunger, or stimulating the POMC CART nucleus, which signals satiety. Thinking of hunger uh, regulation in terms of neurochemical signaling makes me really feel like I'm treating depression. I have an extra row in my chart because I'm expecting the approval of terzepatide for weight management any week now. Uh, if approved, it will be our most effective appetite suppressing medicine with average weight loss of 20 to 22% and signifies the beginning of a game-changing era of appetite regulation. On the next few slides, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to how I use these medicines in my clinic and the guidelines we've created to help you feel comfortable using them. I'm going to warn you, they look very busy. They are busy, but it's because we wanted to take any question that you might ask yourself about using a given med in a given patient and answer it. So these instructions are detailed in the guideline in a step-by-step -step prescribing pathway. So here's the fentramine and fentramine topiramate prescribing pathway. As most of you know, Fentope is approved by the FDA for long-term use, but Fentramine, which got its FDA designation in the 1950s and is much more affordable, uh, is only approved for up to 90 days of use. We looked at the data and want you to know that it's very safe to use Fentramine monotherapy in the same capacity that it's been studied in the Fentope studies, like the same dosing. And there's no legal restriction to doing so in Wisconsin. Decades of retrospective data have shown that people on long-term Fentramine maintain more weight loss than those using it intermittently, and without any evidence of increased coronary disease. And there have been no cases of fentramine dependence. When I ask my patients, what happens when you run out of your med? Are you anxious? Are you agitated? They say, no, I'm just hungry. So depending on patient's insurance coverage, their cost preferences, and their side effect preferences, I'll prescribe them long-term brand name combination pills, fentramine monotherapy, or fentope generics. And of the affordable AOMs, these are my most effective choices. 
When considering these medicines, I ask myself, do they have an obvious contraindication, like a re recent cardiac event, uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, or if they're on meds like other stimulants or beta blockers that act in opposition to stimulants? If they're good from that standpoint, then I get to the, the things that cause us to have a knee-jerk reaction, like, no, you shouldn't be on phentermine. But then we kind of reconsidered. So I talked with the cardiologists. And we, we said, well, if people have a significant amount of weight loss, that can actually improve their heart risks. Um, fentramine can cause hypertension and, and tachycardia, but it most typically does not. And so if we ask patients to monitor their blood pressure, we may find that it comes down with weight loss. So we discussed that if people have systolic blood pressure is less than 150, it might be reasonable to, to let them consider fentramine. If a patient has CAD, but has addressed all of their factors, all of the risk factors pertaining to their cardiovascular disease, if it's been more than three years since their event and their cardiologist is on board, it might be reasonable to trial fentramine. And if they had a temporary episode of AFib or other supraventricular tachycardia that hasn't occurred in more than one years, it might be similarly reasonable to prescribe. We next asked ourselves, if we needed to get EKGs on all patients considering fentramine, because it seems to be what people do, but it was not a routine part of the Fentope clinical trials. We decided that if people had risk factors for long QT interval, like meds that prolong their QT or family history of sudden cardiac death before the age of 50, it makes sense to get an EKG, look at that QT, but otherwise it's probably overkill. The next step is what I consider to be the most important, which is ensuring that patients know what they're signing up for. If I'm using generics, I make sure to let them know that it's technically off-label for long-term use. But more importantly, I tell them I want them to be on this medicine for the foreseeable future if it is effective and tolerated. Many patients are hoping for a med that they can take for three months and then stop. And it's really important for them to know about this up front, that this is a plan for the future. If I then prescribe the medication, I give the patient recommendations for monitoring their blood pressure for the first two weeks after starting the medicine daily, and then weekly for six weeks. I prescribe doses of the generic medicines that most approximate the brand name medication that has the prospective study data. Um, and so that's a, one half of a 37.5 milligram tablet of fentramine and up to 100 milligrams of topiramate. You don't have to write, rush to write all of this down. The guideline includes all of these dosing tips. I've also created an epic smart phrase with the info that you need and also info to give to patients and a favorite orders that you can follow if you're interested. The next decision pathway here is for prescribing GLP-1 agonists, which I expect many of you feel more comfortable prescribing. We know that to avoid using these in patients who have had unprovoked pancreatitis, but case studies have shown that it seems very reasonable to use them when the provocation of pancreatitis has been removed, as in the case of gallstone pancreatitis status post-coli or alcoholic pancreatitis after sobriety. Retinopathy is another concern because we know that retinopathy can get worse on these medicines. Um, but when we discussed this with ophthalmology, we felt that good control of or avoidance of diabetes in the long term is very protective to the eye. So if retinopathy is provoked in the short term on starting a GLP-1, it can be monitored and treated as needed. And then the patient can hopefully have normalization of their blood sugars and stable retinas over the long term. So I just, I recommend really close follow-up with uh, ophthalmology if we're considering starting this or asking permission if they have moderate or severe retinopathy beforehand. We know that gastroparesis can theoretically worsen on GLPs, but it can also theoretically improve. So in talking with GI, we kind of discussed that it's it's okay to have an informed consent discussion with the patient and say like, your symptoms might, might get worse and you might have a pretty bad day of nausea and vomiting. Um, but if you wanted to try this and, and see how it works for you, we could start at a low dose and, and, re, and gradually titrate up. So this, um, we have a very similar decision pathway for the use of naltrexone bupropion, but I skipped showing it to you today for the sake of time. I use naltrexone bupropion least frequently due to relatively low efficacy and high rate of discontinuation. Do, usually my patients just say they have vague side effects, but you can look for that in the guideline too. All right, so when deciding to continue an AOM, we must consider, is it tolerable? That is, to, uh, you know, to say that can, is your patient vomiting every day for, for weeks and months? Cause that's probably not worth being on it. Is it efficacious? Meaning have they lost at least 5% of their body weight by three to six months on the max dose of the medication? And if so, you might consider having some maglutide tattooed in the infinity symbol on your size reduced backside, because this should be a long-term relationship. Um, so the next section I always talk about is surgical and endoscopic procedures. And the title says it all here. We 
particularly endocrinologists, often don't refer to bariatric surgery uh, because we have a tendency to think we can manage metabolic disorders medically. But in the big picture, I tell patients that surgery is the most efficacious and durable weight loss strategy that we have. And its effects are not vulnerable to things like job changes, insurance policy, policy changes, or medication shortages. According to a 2020 study, 82% of people were satisfied with their decision to have bariatric surgery five years after their study. It improves major cardiac events, reduces risk, uh, redu resolves diabetes in almost all cases, and improves quality of life. Patients often tell me, I don't want to take the easy way out. Um, I tell them there is no way that this is easy. One must spend six to nine months prior to the procedure learning about your new anatomy and physiology, learning the new rules to live by. It takes a lot of work, but because we have some changes in your gut hormone signaling, it gives you a significantly higher chance of actually succeeding with your efforts. They say it's too drastic, to which I reply, it's done minimally invasively, laparoscopically with four one-inch incisions, and surgery takes about two and a half to three hours. Most people stay in the hospital one night and are back to many activities at two weeks and full activities by six weeks. They say, I knew someone who gained the weight back. And I say, of course you do. This speaks to the first point. Bariatric surgery is not easy. And if you don't follow the rules, eating when you are hungry, hearing your satiety signals, separating liquids from your solids, avoiding drinking calories, et cetera, you can certainly fail. That's why the pre-work and the follow-up are so important. Bariatric endoscopy is another cool concept where weight loss procedures can be done even less invasively. So come to hear more about bariatric surgery and bariatric endoscopy at Grand Rounds on January 5th. All right, so you may wanna know what kind of results I'm getting with all of this. I reviewed charts of 231 patients, patients I had seen between April of 2021 and June of 2023, for the express purpose of the visit being obesity. So it doesn't include my patients with diabetes, hypogonadism, PCOS, who get the same kind of treatment from me. They ranged in age from 18 to 86 with body mass indices between 27 and 85. 77% were female and about 50% were seen by telehealth. About 20% were referred to me by cardiology, hepatology, bariatric surgery, and transplant, and most of the others self-referred. 6% of my patients are physicians or physician spouses. I found Cushing's in two patients. I found genetic anomalies associated with obesity in eight patients, though none of them led to a change in management. More than 95% of my patients have an obesity-related comorbidity, which is important because I code this as the primary diagnosis because most insurance companies will not reimburse for obesity as, a, uh, as the primary diagnosis. About 80% of my patients left their visit not being sure which strategy they wanted to pursue. Of 231 patients, 172 had at least one follow-up weight taken in the UW system after we had our first visit. And because the clinic access is poor in endocrine clinic, I had only more than one appointment with only 68% of these patients. Most of them had only seen me once, um, but they we frequently had my chart communications after that initial appointment. These are the interventions that they eventually chose, and they're from admittedly granular data. The pharma data reflect whether they had an active prescription on file for the medicine. And you can see a lot of people choose um, either fentramine or the GLP-1 that seems to be most covered by their insurance. Um, the ketogenic diet data are just reflective of people who told me in either follow-up or my chart messages that they were following the ketogenic diet. And the bariatric surgery data reflects people who actually have gone through with bariatric surgery, not just uh, not the ones who are currently in the pipeline who are currently working towards that. Over the course of the time, we saw some adverse events. One patient died, but they notably had not started any of my high intensity therapies. One patient had an eating disorder recurrence. Two needed to stop fentramine due to hypertension. And many had nausea and vomiting on GLP-1s. With average follow-up of 57 weeks, my patients had an average weight loss of 17 pounds or 6.7% of their body weight, 14% gained weight after our appointment, and 19% stayed stable. But 66% of the patients who saw me lost weight and averaged 29 pounds or 11% of their weight on average. I then looked at patients for whom we have more than 12 months of data because I'm not helping anybody if I help them lose by month six and regain by month nine. And I was really excited to see that the weight change seems to be durable, and these two charts look very similar. 
all in all, my cohort of patients is 2,900 pounds net negative. And because averages don't tell the whole story, here I plotted along the x-axis each unique patient in the order that I saw them. And the y-axis is their weight in pounds with the red dot signifying their baseline and the yellow dot demonstrating their most recent weight. A green line will connect the two dots that indicates that the patient lost weight and a red line indicates that they gained weight in follow-up. This first chart is the first 40 patients I saw in 2020 to 2021. So they have longer follow-up. This is reflective of more, more time since, since intervention. And the second chart is patients I've seen in 2020, between January 2023 and June of 2023. So they have less follow-up time, but they've had access to some of the newest medications that have become available. It felt really good to look at this and feel like I am making a real impact. But in the big picture, we need primary prevention. Everything I'm doing is secondary prevention. So what we can do as good citizens, we can take care of our teammates and we can consider for the residency programs um, and the employee health, consider talking about uh, swing shift and night shift work as a risk factor for, for obesity and maybe even having a monitoring program. We can advocate for coverage of anti-obesity medicines under pharma benefits for UW health employees, for Medicare by supporting the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. And the state health insurance plan, I actually just found out this week, they're coming up on another uh, assessment of the data. So if you would like to send advocacy for, for adding anti-obesity therapies to the state health insurance plan, please send a letter to the group insurance board and the information is all here for you. We can use evidence-based nutrition practices and counseling. And I think this is really, really important that we kind of start to see a shift in what we're telling patients um, in the nutrition realm. We need to denormalize food culture. We need to make it so that my, my kid's teacher doesn't reward her for getting the answers right with Skittles. We need to prevent childhood obesity. And uh, speaker has a task force right now on child obesity. Representative Karen Hurd is leading that if anyone's interested in reaching out to her and being involved. And then we need to cut down on the size of brownies in the cafeteria because need I see more. And as good doctors, we can prevent and treat obesity. But you might be nervous to treat obesity because you don't want to offend your patients and you don't want to cause harm or repeat the whole fen, fen fiasco. You didn't learn how to do this in training and your partners don't do it. It's hard to cross cover. And you don't know if your patients are working hard enough on their own to lose weight. These are all valid things, but, but in the big picture, we are not helping our patients live healthy lives unless we are helping our patients achieve healthy weights. And we have this lovely guideline. So this was the first title and then the title apparently just changed. So it's now uh, medication management, but this is newly available like in the past week on Uconnect. And it really, I it has a lot of stuff in it and I hope it really helps you with um, treating obesity. There's charts in it like this, um, which I think is particularly useful for talking to patients. It shows how much an average person loses, but also what percent of patients achieve 5% and 10% weight loss where we have data, and then kind of gives some, some comparative pricing information. And there's a lot of other uh, tools there. And then for those of you who may not have access to Uconnect, if you email me, I will always be happy to provide you with a copy of that guideline I've mentioned but I also am look, working to make this information publicly available through the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality. So we created a toolkit there, um, wchq.org and the obesity toolkit. And it's a lot of the same information that's detailed in the guideline and hopefully accessible to lots of people in the state. And finally, because I know it takes a long time to translate things that you've learned to things that you can document and order in clinic, I want you to consider stealing my smart phrases to simplify your life. So I created the obesity visit smart phrase to take you through step-by-step step, a 40 to 60 minute visit to discuss contributors to weight, consider indications and contraindications for pharmaceuticals and check through a list of comorbidity screening. The GLP-1 dosing smart phrase is a, remi a reminder of the different GLP-1 dose titration schedules along with other notes and whether you need to prescribe pen needles with a given product and stuff like that. And how you might consider adjusting insulin if you're starting a GLP-1 according to my own clinical practice. The weight patient information is some general information that I give to patients about how weight loss typically occurs. SKP keto is a quick and clean guide to the ketogenic diet because I don't even know what dirty keto means. I have information that I give to patients about bariatric surgery, including the clinic's preferred mechanism for generating referrals, which is to have the patient go to the website, create a profile and watch videos ahead of scheduling. I tell patients, they just want you to know what you're getting into before you come in. 
The other smart phrases include the brand names of medications, which are appropriate as they are applicable to the different types of pens and the different doses based on how the medicine is branded. I sometimes have patients buy the eight milligrams maglutide pen, which is branded for diabetes and give themselves smaller doses than is recommended by the manufacturer. This dramatically increases the affordability and instructions are listed under that smart phrase. The fentermetopyramate smart phrase includes all the recommendations for patient blood pressure monitoring and heart rate monitoring. And if you follow my order menu, you'll find that it's easy to order the titration schedule of all of the pesky GLP-1s. So hopefully that will save you some time. So look ahead with me. I see in our future blood sugars of 90 and blood pressures of 114 over 74. I see patients moving through life without pain and being able to, uh, to participate in activities that they had been not able to participate in. So remember, the really, really scary things on Halloween and all year round are the Smarties and the Dum Dums. Just avoid the pure sugar candies. Potlucks in an endocrinology clinic, teenage body image, diets, juice, and misinformation, aka the internet. Thank you so much for listening to me today, and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Well, thank you, Sam, for a wonderful overview. Um, and they are, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Uh, the first is a, a quick question. The URL to the guidelines, um, perhaps uh, people can reach out to you directly. Um, so if you go on you connect and search it uh, if you if you go on you connect and search obesity that's that's how I find it uh, you have to be logged into you connect so I think just giving the URL doesn't really help so much okay great um, and if that anybody has any any problems finding it I'm, I will volunteer you um, to help them so there's a question, thoughts on adding naltrexone to patients who have been on bupropion for depression but want and need to lose weight? Can a GLP-1 also be added? Um, so adding naltrexone, I've done it a lot clinically and I don't typically see much of an improvement. So I've kind of stopped doing it. Um, GLP-1s, there's no, no contraindication to having, having a GLP-1 on board with bupropion. So that would be the preferred mechanism if it's affordable. Okay, great. Um, so uh, a question about or a comment about the importance of adequate sleep duration and quality um, in, during weight loss. So how do you talk about uh, the importance of sleep and how do you counsel on sleep with um, weight loss and weight gain? Yeah, so I, I first ask people how many hours of sleep they're actually getting. And sometimes that's low because they are having sleep disruptions. They're getting up and we kind of talk about any ways that that they can mitigate that. But sometimes it's low because they're not giving themselves enough sleep. And I really talk about, you need to prioritize you and your life and, and carve out an, at least seven hours of time to, to sleep. Um, I screen everybody for sleep apnea and uh, most people screen high risk. So I, I send a lot of referrals to the sleep clinic. Uh, and then I also talk about using pharmaceuticals to help people fall asleep because a lot of those have a, a weight related side effect. So particularly first generation antihistamines will, will um, slow metabolic rate a little bit. And so I talk, I make sure to know, to make, uh, make people not, uh, not just switch to, to using Benadryl to fall asleep all the time. Great. And maybe we can stop sharing the screen as well. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, in terms of when you're seeing a patient uh, and your algorithm, do you go with medical management first before bariatric surgery? Where's, where are your branch points? I tell every patient about all of those options. Um, I say what we, what we have is a menu and any of these could work for you. And it's dependent on what your lifestyle is. Uh, obviously there are some patients who don't meet the criteria for bariatric surgery, so I don't go through it there. Um, but I think even the first time I meet somebody, it's reasonable for me to tell them about bariatric surgery because it is, it is a, the most efficacious, b the most durable. And, and it's like, I really think that for like the, the thought of needing to try and fail medicines first, isn't a reasonable thought because medicines are so difficult to get right now. Um, and then can you uh, talk a little bit about um, screening and treating eating, eating disorders as part of your clinic and how, wh where that intersection is? Yeah, there is so much a need for for more data here because there are no national guidelines that talk about this. And I've I've put in a request to the Obesity Society to, to develop a guideline on this. 
Um, I ask all of my patients if they have ever been told they had or thought they had an eating disorder. Uh, and I find that a lot of women had eating disorders in their teens that seem to have completely resolved um, by the time that they were in their mid twenties or mid thirties. And uh, what we recommend in the guideline is that patients who have had a history of eating disorder should follow with health psychology while they are endeavoring to lose weight, just to make sure that none of those thoughts come back. Uh, I also screen, screen everybody for binge eating disorder, which is really, really comorbid in uh, class three obesity. And when I find binge eating disorder, I often recommend pharmaceutical therapy, pharmaceutical therapy along with um, behavioral therapy. Um, and so uh, a question came up in terms of holding, uh, what do you do with the anti-obesity medications if a patient's in, in, inpatient admitted? Do you hold, do you continue? Um, Great, great question. I think the only one that you might want to, might need to continue would be topiramate. If you stop that suddenly, you can have rebound um, seizures, um, which is one of the reason I, reasons I really like having fentramine and topiramate separated in the generics, because most of the time, if somebody's admitted to the hospital, you're definitely going to want to stop their fentramine. Usually their topiramate dose isn't so high that you really need to taper it. So if it's less than, if it's 50 or 25, it's not an issue, but if it's a hundred, I might like taper that for a day or two. Um, in terms of any other medicines, I would generally stop them when someone's hospitalized. Okay, great. Um, and how do you address uh, a trauma history, you know, uh, and emotional um, triggers for obesity as part of your your counseling? It is very difficult. When I when I meet people, I ask them to take me through. I, I say, "Tell me your story with weight." And it almost always includes their their history of their life, really. Um, and so I do a lot of of acknowledging that trauma that that trauma really um, likely contributed to the to their weight gain, and that we know that emotional insults really can upset things. And then I I refer to health psych or or um, psychology in general if, if they need, so I do health psych, if they have eating tendencies that are related to their emotions, like it's, it's a specific, um, emotion that's, that's tying to a behavior. And if they just feel like they need to cope with some things that happened in their past in general, I refer to psychology and my, my one hour appointment is, is totally inadequate. Like, I'm not saying that I'm doing this well, I'm, I'm just trying. Great. Um, and then what do you see as potential long-term complications of meds like semaglutide? I comment, I have two patients who have persistent nausea and vomiting, suggesting gastroparesis is not how to differentiate. Is it the medication effect or the underlying diabetes? Yeah, we've been using um, GLP-1 since 2008. And so we have, you know, 18 years of data. We none of there, there haven't been large clinical trial reports of of gastroparesis being a consequence of the medicine. And so we feel most likely that people who have gastroparesis, even like when the medicine is stopped, probably have it from a, from a different cause, often diabetes. Um, there, this has made national media attention recently. And the, the big thing is there was this patient who came forward with a, with a lawsuit saying, I was taking Ozempic every day for, for a whole year and vomiting every day, and I'm going to sue the company. And we just need to be using common sense. If you are on this medication and having those side effects, you just need to stop the medicine. It is not worth worth uh, that kind of risk to you. But um, there have been a couple of people who have said that they have the, the gastroparesis even after stopping the medicine. And we, we don't think that that's a, a, an effect of the med class. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of interest in the media, et cetera, about uh, the anti-obesity medications um, and uh, with stopping the medications, do we know, does every, do you regain all of the weight? Do you regain more than what you lost? Uh, what do we know about that? Um, there, I should have had some of these pictures, but the, the guide or the, um, pharm the recent pharmaceutical trials have done an arm where they stop the medicine and they see what happens to people who then transition to getting placebo. And what they tend to do by about two and a half years is regain up to the, the average that they were at previously. I certainly anecdotally have had patients who stop and regain above to where they were previously, but in terms of averages, we were seeing regain about up to, up to that. I also have had like one or two patients who stops a, a GLP-1 
and has been able to maintain the weight loss so far, but I only have six months of being able to follow them. I don't know what's going to happen in another year. Uh, you know, we know that statistically they are, they are more than 97% likely to regain. Um, okay. Vince, any questions? Yeah. Uh, Sam, uh, Dr. Pavic, that was a great talk. What is, is there any mechanism currently for e-consulting? I mean, obviously there's just an enormous need for information. You did a terrific job, but I could see a lot of people being overwhelmed by all the information. And I think that guideline is going to be helpful, but is there a mechanism for e-consults uh, for, for this uh, condition? Not right now. And then um, use of any of the medications in patients who who are want to become pregnant. Yeah, this is another one where I, I have asked for guidance from national societies because it, I see a lot of patients who are referred from repro endo. Um, the medicines, so fentramine, this is all detailed in the guideline. Fentramine has a pretty good safety record. Um, so people have even become pregnant on fentramine uh, and we haven't seen and dangerous consequences. So I will let people be on fentramine up to the point of pregnancy, taking regularly pre regular pregnancy tests to make sure that they are not pregnant and stopping it as soon as they uh, achieve pregnancy. Topiramate is a definite no-no. Um, naltrexone and bupropion are reasonable. And then with the GLP ones, we just don't have enough data right now. And so uh, they, there have been studies in rats and some non-human primates that show increased risk uh, of fetal malformations. And then the bigger picture is that we know when you stop the medicines, you tend to regain any weight. So big picture, if you lose a bunch of weight, get pregnant, stop the medicine and regain, are we doing some harm by causing excessive amounts of weight gain in the first trimester? And there's just been like one very small case series of this where they said that those patients who regained in the first trimester actually nullified the benefits that they had had of losing weight prior to the pregnancy. And so we just need a lot more data on this. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll ask, uh, so with our food culture that is, you know, prevalent and Halloween is coming up and your kids are going to go trick or treating. So how do you manage what do you give out for Halloween candy and <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I um I never my kids just do not get anything that's only sugar. Um what we know from from all my patients who have diabetes is that if you have a, a candy or a sweet that has some protein or some fat in it, it it affects the blood sugar a little bit differently on a CGM. It, it doesn't cause quite so crazy of a spike. So we don't do Starburst or Skittles. We do like chocolates and and um, nut based Snickers. candies. What? Snickers. We do Snickers. Yep. Um, and then uh, really we have a, a very careful discussion about when we have when we have sweets and when we don't. We know that keeping sweets away from kids causes them to have behaviors like hiding and sneaking sneaking food. So we we just kind of really talk about um, how we we know that sugar in high capacities can cause bad diseases. And that, that is, that's the thing that's dangerous. We don't talk about fat as an intermediary. We talk about like, if you eat a lot of candy, you can get diabetes. Not that, that um, we're worried about adiposity necessarily. Um, and then uh, my final, the last question is any data on the use of some of these medications and weight loss in athletic performances? Ooh, that is just outside of my realm of knowledge. So I do, I have patients who come to me saying that they want to both gain weight and, or lose weight and gain muscle. Um, this has been a couple of like weightlifters and I can't do it. I, you can't do it when you lose, when you lose fat, you lose muscle. And I don't, I have not yet successfully been able to help somebody lose adipose while simultaneously gaining muscle. Okay, great. Well, thank you for a wonderful overview um, and uh, uh, for really helpful hints and um, an update on where the field is heading. It's really an exciting, uh, I think it's a really exciting time um, for weight loss management. Um, and I feel like there's optimism for uh, some really impactful interventions. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.